I'm Sharon Lagas. I am uh, one of the co-founders of the Alport Syndrome Foundation, and I'm going to be your host today for this first session, and I'm going to open the day. It's very nice to see uh, many of you, um, and I really thank you for joining us on a Sunday. Uh, before we um, dig into the session, um, I would just like to um, thank our executive director, Lisa Bonebrake, and our director of communications, Kevin Schnur, for uh, working really hard to turn this meeting into a virtual meeting and, um, and just all their hard work that went into making this meeting a success and everybody else that, um, that has joined in that as well. I have a few housekeeping notes before we actually begin the session. Uh, please note that all of the attendees are muted. You can see us, but we can't see you. If you experience internet connection troubles, please try leaving the live session and you'll automatically be let back in. Closed captioning is available in both the smartphone app and the web browser. See the app guide for more details. If you're using your smartphone, um, app, but also want to view the sessions in a larger format, you can utilize the web browser link found in our app guide on your computer, iPad, or tablet. We updated our app and the web browser link today to include lots of new content. You can refresh the app before use and use together to maximize con con uh, connectivity issues. Please check out the pre-recorded sessions. There's sessions on the app on uh, research, on clinical trials, on advocacy, and there's also information um, for kids, 9 to 12, and there's a bunch of ASF resources. So we obviously couldn't do everything live, um, so we've done a lot of recorded sessions for you to review at your leisure. So please check those out. Uh, this session is all about asking questions. That's why we're here. So please use the Q&A function on your screen to type questions. Um, only the moderators will be able to see um, the questions and we'll bring them to the attention of the speakers. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please include that person's name in your, in your question. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. Uh, you can join us in the virtual cafe on the app after the session, or you can always email us. Lastly, please use the Zoom chat feature only to report uh, software difficulties, and we'll do our best to address them. Again, only submit your questions via the Q&A box. So let's get started with our session on women and girls with Alport syndrome. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and then I'm going to ask all the panelists to introduce themselves and to provide a, a brief description um, in their experiences treating patients with Alport syndrome or chronic kidney disease. So as a woman with um, Alport syndrome, um, I have had three generations of my family, seven family members across the generations affected by Alport syndrome. We actually have four females and three males that are affected in our family. I'm uh, also a parent of um, two uh, Alport patients, my two sons, and I'm a patient myself. Um, I have stage three, 3B uh, chronic kidney disease, um, beginnings of heart disease, and I've experienced pregnancy-related complications. So um, obviously, I am a woman who is affected by Alport syndrome and not just a carrier. So with that, I would like to start with Dr. Rowe and ask her to introduce herself and again, provide some brief um, information on her experiences treating Alport syndrome patients. All right, so I am Dr. Michelle Rowe. I'm a pediatric nephrologist at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And I first became interested in Alport syndrome about 20 years ago um, when I was in training. And I helped to um, create the first mouse model of X-linked Alport syndrome. So before that, there were lots of animal models, but just of uh, male mice with Alport syndrome. And this was the first time we were able to um, study the female mice. And that's how I first got interested in women with Alport syndrome um, and have since transitioned to clinical research. But this has remained an interest of mine um, and I've really enjoyed um, working with the Alport Syndrome Foundation on sessions like this in the past, because I think there are so many questions that, that people have and misconceptions out there. Uh, Dr. Inker? Hi, uh, I'm Leslie Inker. I'm a nephrologist at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. 
Uh, I, I'm uh, new to the Elport family, uh, new to the, med to the medical advisory group. And I came to Elports in a research way through asking to, I was asked to be the site PI for one of the Elports treatment trials. And this has been just an astoundingly wonderful experience for me, meeting people who are deeply engaged in getting the better health for themselves as well as for their families and other patients who follow them. It's been really inspirational to meet all those research participants. Um, from a clinical perspective, I would say that particularly when it comes to women with Alport syndrome, it's changing, it's evolving as we understand the different genetics that our understanding of how it affects women have changed. And I can see patients who have been cared for our, with years in our clinic, and then I see them with this new lens and say, oh, you probably have Alport syndrome. It's more obvious when there's men in the family who've had kidney disease, but not everybody has men in their family, and it's, um, or there's a different genetic pattern, and then you say, oh, this must be what you have. And I think potentially being on the cusp of potential treatments is, is really an exciting time. So I'm delighted to be here for the first time. And uh, Dr. McKelvey? Hi. I'm Dr. Erin McKelvey, and I am a staff physician OBGYN at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. I'm located in Medina, Ohio, so just a little bit south of Cleveland. I have yet to care for a patient with outports, but I have cared for women during pregnancies who have chronic kidney disease. And that's how I came into contact with Dr. James Simon, who asked me to uh, sit on the panel today, as there have been a lot of questions in the past regarding reproductive um, issues and pregnancy as it relates to outports, and I'll try to chime in and help out the best that I can. Okay. And uh, thank you again for um, giving us your time on a Sunday. So let's dig in. Um, we have some questions coming in, but we also have some questions that we get on our Facebook page on a regular basis. So I wanted to address some of those quickly first, and then we'll get to um, some of the questions that are popping up on the Q uh, the Q and A. So um, let's just first address the issue of Alport syndrome being considered a male disease. I was on a webinar last week and that was used again, that Alport syndrome is a male disease. So um, I would um, like to direct this question to Dr. Rowe. Why is it just as important to diagnose and follow girls or women with Alport syndrome? And um, why um, are they not just carriers? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And that's one of the big misconceptions about Alport syndrome is that it only affects males. Um, but throughout the history of Alport syndrome, that was, that was the teaching and that was the case um, back uh, even to when Alport syndrome was first characterized back in the 1920s when it first got a name from Dr. Alport. Um, he believed that women were really not, not affected very often. But as we've, as we've um, studied it more over the years, we realized that women actually can be affected by Alport syndrome. Um, so for males who have Alport syndrome, um, they have one um, Alport syndrome affected gene on their X chromosome. And because women have two X chromosomes, they have one um, Alport affected gene and then one um, normal gene. So they have only half of their, um, half of their uh, kidney is affected essentially but it is still affected and, is, and has that abnormal um, type four collagen in their, in their kidney. So it's, it's not quite right to say that they're just a carrier. Um, carrier tends to, tends to signify that um, it's something that you may pass down, but you're not really affected by. And that's, that's how people think of it, um, just kind of in the, in the general population. And even um, from a genetic standpoint, Carrier really means that um, you know that you're that you're not expressing symptoms of the disease, but if you look at women who have X-linked Alport syndrome, almost all of them have some sort of um, effect from the disease. Some may just have a little bit of blood in their urine for their entire lifetime, and that's the only manifestation of the disease. But it's still something. Um, many more may have some degree of chronic kidney disease, um, and then a smaller percentage will have. Um, will have end-stage kidney disease or need dialysis or a transplant. So it's not quite right to say that they're just a carrier. Um, identifying women as having Alport syndrome really um, 
ensures that people are monitoring them to make sure that their disease doesn't progress or to offer them treatments for Alport syndrome when those are available because women may benefit from those just as well as men would. Thank you, Michelle. Um, maybe I'll direct this to Dr. Inker. Do uh, girls and women follow the same treatment regimen, uh, ACE and ARBs, um, as men? And it, are there any differences or side effects, perhaps, between the men and the women? I think many women have the same treatment regimen for Alport syndrome and for general kidney disease. Uh, it depends on the age. We The way in which we manage some of these issues may be different, particularly related to child rearing years. Uh, ACEs and ARBs shouldn't be used in pregnant women, and so we would want to ask women if they're of childbearing years, whether they are considering pregnancy and then make uh, guidelines and or treatment recommendations for them uh, based on that consideration. But in general, we wouldn't change the treatment for men and women with Alport syndrome. Um, Michelle? Yeah, and I would just um, say that the, the current treat re treatment recommendations are the same for men and women. So any um, man or woman or girl or boy with Alport syndrome who also has protein in their urine should be offered treatment with an ACE inhibitor because there is really good evidence now. Um, most of the evidence is in men, but it likely applies to women as well that treatment with an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker can slow the progression of your chronic kidney disease. So that's important for women and for men. Do you see any, any differences in the response to the medication? between men and women? I, I personally don't have a, a sufficient experience to be able to determine that in Alport specifically, but there's been no data in the general chronic kidney disease world, or as I, I actually don't know the Alport studies where I would be concerned at all there, there would be a difference between the men and women in the response to uh, blockade of the renin angiotensin system. Um, obviously, one of the biggest topics is family planning and pregnancy uh, when it comes to women. Um, so I'm going to direct this to Dr. McKelvey. Uh, what advice do you give your, um, your female uh, patients, Alport or CKD patients, that are planning to get pregnant? Do you discuss genetic testing, amniocentesis, IVF, or other things that might be available to them? So. With any patient who comes in, I'm always trying to be as proactive as we can. And when I have a patient who has a chronic medical condition, no matter what it is, I will often push to you know, empower that patient to think about what they want. And rather than plenty of people show up, oh, we just got pregnant. Think about your family planning. Think about when you want to do this. And then let's maximize the health and your disease status so that we can get that as under control as we can. As um, the other panelists spoke about, there are certain medications that are great for outports, but really are not wonderful for pregnancy. And we need to shy away from those. Realizing I wanna think about having a family in the next few months or the next year, when can we transition over to different medications to control some of the issues that you have so that you're on a medication that's safe while you're pregnant, um, before you find yourself pregnant, which is always a concern. And unfortunately, we can't go back in the Wayback Time Machine and not get pregnant and not get exposed to something. Um, in terms of genetic diagnosis, um, if there's familial inheritance patterns or known mutations, early diagnosis can be offered, so CVS or amniocentesis, or um, if you're undergoing um, infertility with IVF, pre-implantation genetic testing can be done, but when there's a known mutation. Um, I'm gonna direct this, I'll start with you, Dr. McKelvey again. Um, can women with Alport syndrome have a successful pregnancy, uh, whether they are in pre-renal failure, dialysis, or transplant, and perhaps um, how they're monitored uh, depending on where they are in the stages of their disease. So again, with my limited experience that I have with patients uh, in chronic kidney disease, and unfortunately without any experience in outports, I will say that 
With close monitoring, it's very likely that women will be able to have a successful pregnancy. However, um, it would look different for each type of patient. So your patient who is kind of in that pre-renal disease state, we know that you have disease, but you haven't started manifesting any issues yet. It's, we'd probably want to follow them a little bit more closely than we would for an otherwise healthy woman. So more frequent uh, visits, uh, more blood work to follow and make sure that we're not seeing any other disease statuses, things such as preeclampsia. For the patients who are gonna be on dialysis or transplant patients, they are absolutely gonna be followed more closely, more intensive monitoring with ultrasounds, um, more than likely at minimum should be co-managed with um, a team approach with your high-risk OB doctors um, and the nephrologist working together to make sure that we try to maximize getting that patient as far as we can and as safely and healthily uh, for a good pregnancy outcome. Thank you. Dr. Anker? I think the best data on pregnancy outcomes and kidney disease in general come from cohorts in Italy, which have wonderful data on pregnancies. And the, when you think of a pregnancy, you have multiple people involved. You have what happens to the woman and the outcome for her and her kidney disease, and you have the baby or the fetus. And so you can, the outcomes have been described both in those contexts. And in general, based on the level of the kidney function, which is the CKD stage, at earlier stages, GFR greater than 60, stage one or two, there's, there's little data that there's harm for the baby. Um, there's, depending on the, the blood pressure, there may be higher risk for hypertension, worsening hypertension and pleocramsia, and possibly worsening of kidney disease. But the increases in the outcomes for adverse outcomes de increase as the GFR goes down. Um, most women with Alports would probably be in the higher stages um, when they're in their pregnant, in, in their childbearing years. Of course, I'm making a generalization. Everybody's different and we 100% agree with the teamwork approach to really think what's right for you. Um, but they may have proteinuria. And there's not a lot of data on the, the risk for adverse outcomes based on the amount of proteinuria, even in general kidney disease. So I think I would really very much agree to planning ahead of time and conversations with a really good team of doctors to make the decision that's, that's right for you and you're in the best hands before and during and after the pregnancy. Thank you. Dr. Rao? Uh, as, as Dr. Inker was saying, we have a lot of information about women with chronic kidney disease in general and how their, how their um, pregnancies um, progress and what the outcomes are. But we don't have a lot of information about Alport syndrome in particular. Um, we would suspect that it may be similar, but there may be differences that we just aren't aware of yet. Um, the entire kind of medical literature on, on pregnancy and Alport syndrome is about eight to 10 case reports, which are just um, kind of written papers about individual patients. And it's always a little bit hard to, to understand much from those cases. But most of them describe uh, an increase in protein in the urine during the, during the pregnancy that then Im either improves afterward or comes down to a slightly higher baseline than before. Um, also, some reports of women whose creatinine gets worse over the time of, um, or uh, after pregnancy, others where the kidney function really stays the same. So it's, um, it's kind of, it's a little bit all over the place and it, it really, you know, goes to that importance of um, individual monitoring. Yeah. And, um, you know, anecdotally, uh, we have a lot of women that have experienced preeclampsia uh, during their pregnancies. And um, I guess, Dr. McKelvey, I would ask, start with you, um, is that unique to Alport syndrome? Um, or is it, do you see that in um, chronic, all chronic disease patients? Um, and, and maybe you could speak a little bit about your experiences with women in preeclampsia. Okay, yeah. So, um, in terms of just general kidney disease, uh, renal disease in and of itself and any, any and all comers will increase the baseline risk for preeclampsia. Um, many other things fall into that category. If you've had a prior history, other hypertensive disorders, whatnot. Um, our recent literature is pointing to uh, use of a daily baby aspirin starting at 12 weeks is the one thing that we have and can help to decrease the potential for either recurrent preeclampsia or if this is a first pregnancy and you are at higher risk, such as a woman who has Alport syndrome. Um, it's a very easy uh, treatment to begin 
taking your baby aspirin every single day may help to decrease that potential. Unfortunately, again, we don't have any preventative measures, but it's one of the best things that we can do. And it's an easy, simple thing to do that can help to decrease the risk. Uh, and then um, are there any issues with um, ACE taking ACE and ARBs or transplant medications? Uh, we already talked about ACE and ARBs. You don't take, you don't want to take when you're trying to get pregnant, but um, after pregnancy, like, can you go back on ACE and ARBs perhaps when you're nursing? Um, so uh, uh, I don't, Dr. Inker, would you like to answer that? I, uh, I, Dr. McCovey gave a nice smile, so I'm going to let her take okay. it. Okay, okay, sorry. So um, for, for the ACE inhibitors, uh, some of them will be listed as what we call L2, which is L1 is going to be your safest thing to take with breastfeeding. So drinking water, water is going to be an L1. Amoxicillin, I believe, is probably an L1. Um, L2 is in our next safest category. And um, some of the ACE inhibitors are listed as L2. And then we fall into um, some of the other ones are going to be listed as an L3. Looking through the ARBs, I believe most of them are, are, are L3s. But we have to look at, and so what an L3 is, and I'm just going to pull my Dr. Hale book. Uh, there are no controlled studies in breastfeeding women. However, the risk of untoward effects to a breastfed infant is possible, or controlled studies show only minimal non-threatening adverse effects. And I realize this is a very emotionally charged topic because women want to bond with their child and many women will see breastfeeding as one of the ways to maximize that bonding and they want to do everything they can to safely breastfeed but then we also have to look at it's that flip coin where there are women who are willing to risk their health because they want to protect their baby and really the best thing for the baby is a healthy mom who sticks around for a while um, so if what's best for mom's kidney function is going to be reinstitution of that ARB, it's likely that it will be okay with breastfeeding. Okay, thank you. And, and I can add that, you know, these decisions are over time. Chronic kidney disease and Alport syndrome is really slowly progressive. So this is why it's good to have a nephrologist and, and obstetrics doctor who you can really communicate with. Well, it's really important for me to actually maximize both, not give harm to my baby and to breastfeed. Okay, what if we did that for six months? What's my level of proteinuria and therefore what potential um, benefit could I get from ACE or ARB? It may not be that great for six months, but after six months, we have a different discussion. I'm using six months really as a conceptual point, not a, not a specific comment that there was often time to make these decisions and uh, that you, again, a healthcare team who really can talk to you about what is right for you and your family and what's right for your stage of kidney disease and Alpert syndrome is, I think, my recommendation. Dr. McKelvey? And I absolutely agree with Dr. Inker. Having that team approach and having physicians who can collaborate and communicate together amongst themselves and with you is very important realizing what the patient's goals are, but also knowing how long your plans for breastfeeding are. When do you think it would be, how long would it be safe to be off a of medication? Those are all things to investigate together. Okay. And as we, as we talked about, every woman with Alport syndrome is going to be unique and the same kind of rules or same recommendations won't apply to each to each woman the same. So it is important to have your team who knows you to give those recommendations. Michelle, how did you know we had a question on lionization um, <laughs> and, and how that uh, affects women differently? I don't know how, if you can briefly describe that, but that's one of the questions Ooh, we have. <laughs> that's a tough one to describe. Um, so because women have two X chromosomes, um, we have evolved so that we turn one of them off just randomly so that the genes from one of your X chromosomes is expressed. So if you have one normal type four collagen and one Alport type four collagen on, on the two X chromosomes, just by random chance, um, the normal one might be turned on or the Alport one might be turned on. And if by random bad luck, you have more of the Alport um, X chromosome turned on, your kidney may be more affected 
um, if by random bad luck or random good luck, you have the good um, X chromosome turned on, then you may have more of a, of a normal um, kidney function. So in a typical woman, that ratio is about 50-50. So your kidney would be 50% um, a normal type 4 collagen and 50% your Alport type 4 collagen. But it can skew anywhere from 80-20, um, 60-40, and it really, um, you can't tell in an individual person what that, what that difference might be. Um, so this is one of the things that impacts whether women um, will uh, have worse kidney disease or um, better kidney disease over time. Unfortunately, for an individual woman, there's no way for us to know what that kind of ratio is for, for you. Okay. And I've been notified that there is, um, in Dr. Simon's presentation, that's been pre-recorded. There's information on that as well. Um, there's a question here about diffuse, and I always have a hard time saying this, lyomatosis, I believe. Um, they want to know if there's um, anything new, um, any new research um, this has affected this person most as a, as a patient. Uh, I, can, I can start with that one. Um, that's a great question. And if Alport syndrome is a rare disease, um, Alport syndrome with diffuse lyomyomatosis is definitely a rare disease. Um, so this is a syndrome, if, those, if anybody doesn't know about it, it's a, it's a um, syndrome that happens when you're not only missing part of the um, FOL4A5 gene or type the alpha-5 type 4 collagen gene, but also missing part of the alpha-6 gene or COL4A6. And when you happen to miss both of those together, you develop Alport syndrome, but also you develop smooth muscle tumors. And these can happen in um, uh, your uterus um, and in your kind of female genital tract, or it can occur in the esophagus. So you may have difficulty with swallowing. And unfortunately, because it is so rare, there's very little research or information done on the on lyomyomatosis in Alport syndrome itself. Um, but there are um, women who have, have these kind of smooth muscle tumors that are not related to Alport syndrome. And Dr. McKelvey might know more about that. So other than um, understanding that there's a link between uh, fibroid development or lyomyo, sorry, lyomyo uh, <laughs> tumors in the uterus, um, that would be something that we would just manage any potential issues that female might have with um, fibroids, which could include heavier uh, menstrual flow, pain. But for some women, they may not have any gynecologic symptoms, even with um, fibroid tumors or lyomyo uh, tumors in their uterus. Okay. Um, there's another question here about um, is there any research for post transplant care specifically? to women with a genetic disease like Alport syndrome. Um, so is there any different approach to post-transplant care and immunosuppression? Uh, Dr. Inker, do you? Uh, in general, there's some variation in transplant care amongst individuals, but um, more pertaining to diseases that are gonna reoccur in the transplanted kidney or based on your underlying risk for immunosuppression. And so Alport syndrome patients would generally fall into the routine protocols that you'd have at your own institution. But one question we didn't quite answer, which Sharon, you had uh, raised earlier, which is considerations for immunosuppressive medications during pregnancy. And absolutely there are. There are changes we make in uh, immunosuppression in the women who are considering getting pregnant. And so that's another really important time to speak to your doctors. And one other question that comes up a lot with regards to transplant is, can a woman with X-linked Alport syndrome be a kidney donor for her son or daughter? Um, women, um, you know, we, we're caregivers. We want to take care of our families. We want to donate kidneys to our, to our children if they need a kidney. And it's important to recognize that there may be risks to a woman who has X-linked Alport syndrome if they give up one of their kidneys, um, more risk than in the general population. Um, so our recommendations are um, for women with X-linked Alport syndrome really not to be considered as donors. Um, there is a small amount of literature. There was one study that looked at six women 
um, with X-linked Telfort syndrome who donated kidneys in Europe. And what they found is that um, over two to 10 years, um, all of them had a decline in their kidney function and all of them had an increase in their, um, in their protein in their urine. Um, I've got uh, two questions here um, concerning the treatment um, and the thinking about using ACE or ARBs in patients only presenting with hematuria. Um, there's a mom here who has um, two young children um, that have moderate hematuria um, and some blood pressure issues, but they haven't been put on any medication. So, um, uh, Dr. Rowe, maybe you could um, address that question. Yeah, so um, over the past six months, there was just a study that was reported out of Germany um, where children who had microscopic hematuria and Alport syndrome were randomized to either get an ACE inhibitor or a placebo, which is no, no treatment. And what they found in that study is that children who were treated with um, an ACE inhibitor had a lower likelihood of progressing over that time period to develop protein in their urine, and they had less of a decline in their kidney function. Um, and there were very few side effects noted from the ACE inhibitors in that, um, in that study. Now, unfortunately, because in Germany, a lot of those patients were already on ACE inhibitors, they weren't able to get enough patients in the study to really 100% say, this is what you should do. So it was suggestive that there may be a benefit to ACE inhibitors, but it's not a, you know, it's not a slam dunk. So what we're recommending is that if you have a child who has um, Alport syndrome, you know they have Alport syndrome, it's you know, genetically confirmed or biopsy or however you've made the diagnosis, and they just have microscopic hematuria, that you talk to your, talk to your pediatric nephrologist about the potential risks and benefits of being on the medicine. Um, and then uh, they will take your preferences, hopefully, in mind, um, what the risks to your child is, um, and really be able to talk that over. Uh, they'll look at the mutation that you have in your family. Some mutations may be more likely to progress rapidly, and you might have more benefit there. Um, so it's really, we, we recommend just individual decision-making at that point with your doctor. Thank you. Uh, there's a question on, is there any data specifically published on a chance of renal failure for women with X-linked Alport syndrome that have a missense mutation? So there, um, in men with X-linked Alport syndrome, there tends to be variation or their uh, risk of end-stage or timing of end-stage kidney disease depends on their mutation. So if they have a, what's called a truncating mutation or a more severe mutation, they will more likely develop end-stage kidney disease early on, so in their maybe late teens, early 20s without treatment. And if they have a missense mutation, which is maybe they just have one amino acid that's changed, but the rest of the gene is okay, then they may develop end-stage kidney disease more in their 40s. So knowing what your mutation is as a man can affect can, or can tell you when you might expect to develop end-stage kidney disease. Unfortunately for women, there's not that what we call genotype phenotype correlation. So because of that lionization that we talked about, um, simply knowing the mutation itself doesn't impact what your risk of end-stage kidney disease is. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a, a comment here, I'm, I'm gonna direct this to Dr. McKelvey um, uh, about a patient who has recurring um, fibroids um, she says she has ASDL, um, and is there um, anything, any research or anything specifically or information um, that she could be directed to? Uh, well, first I'll have to beg ignorance on ASDL. Uh, I, I don't know if she means auto, uh, Alport syndrome dominant. I, I'm not exactly sure, but. Okay. Um, so, I would probably, not that I'm aware of, if there's any specific um, research or literature regarding um, the link of difference in management in fibroids in women who have Alports. Um, so making the assumption that this, you know, a patient with Alports from a gynecologic standpoint, if she has fibroids would be managed like any other uh, patient. Um, again, just trying to 
it depends on what their symptoms are. Is it pain? Is it bleeding? Is it something that was incidentally found on an exam or an ultrasound? And then just managing the symptoms that they're having. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Um, there's a, another um, comment about um, a woman with Alport syndrome that suffers recurrent and awful um, urinary tract infections. And um, was just curious if um, you've seen this in other Alport syndrome patients or women with CKD. Um, yeah, I can, we, we, I mean, I do see women with urinary tract infections, some of which are quite resistant. It, it tends to be more related to ana, anatomic changes in the urinary tract that doesn't allow for free emptying of the bladder. Uh, I don't think, to my knowledge, Alfred syndrome is not particularly related to any very any abnormalities in the urinary tract that would that that would lead to persistent recurrent urinary tract infections. Dr. Rao, any any other thoughts about that? No, well, I would I would agree with that. Um, urinary tract infections in women are quite common. And so it wouldn't be unusual to have a woman who could have urinary tract infections and have Alport syndrome, but there, there's not um, necessarily a connection between the two. Uh, there's a question here about um, transmission. Mm -hmm. um, I believe um, this family has X-linked Alport syndrome and they had 100% transmission rate instead of 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and have you seen this before? Absolutely. You have to remember that the 50% transmission to your children is, um, it's a 50% risk with each pregnancy. Your chances start over with every pregnancy. And in small families like we have now in the U.S. or anywhere else really, um, you may have all four of your kids might be affected with Alport syndrome just by kind of random roll of the dice. So it's not uncommon to see that 100% transmission. Thank you. Um, is there any evidence that ACE or ARBs can slow the progression of CKD, even if it does not reduce proteinuria? Dr. Inker, would you like to start? Yeah. So in general, in the general population of all the studies, there was reduction in proteinuria. And the difference between treatment arms and the reduction in proteinuria correlates with the treatment effect on the clinical endpoint. But with every individual person, there was there was a lot of variation. That means some people would have a reduction in proteinuria in the treatment arm, and they would still get benefit, and other people would not get a, a reduction in proteinuria and, and still will get benefit. So unfortunately, there's not a, the reduction in proteinuria is not an, a marker for an individual person's response to therapy. It would be so nice if it was. It would help. All, uh, help all of you and help all of us really guide therapy. Um, but unfortunately, it's not, it's not the proteinuria and its change with therapy is not sensitive enough, enough as a marker of, of what we call therapeutic uh, index. Um, here's an, um, an AS patient um, who um, experienced uh, uh, children early, three weeks early, uh, low birth rate, under five pounds, each had some breathing issues, um, and she had some placenta issues. She said this was never diagnosed as related to Alport syndrome, but could that have been the issue? Uh, Dr. McKelvey? Yeah, and more than likely, there, her Alports was playing um, a link into that. Um, it, May also depend, though, where she was in stage of disease, um, if she had any high blood pressure issues, because that absolutely can um, contribute to earlier births, lower birth rates, um, issues with the placenta. Okay. Um, there's just, I think we just need to make a clarification. There was a question about, I thought aspirin and NSAIDs are contraindicated in Alports. Um, maybe we can just clarify that. Uh, Dr. Rowe, would you like to? Sure. So both of both medications are painkillers, but they work in different ways, and they're different types of medications. Um, so NSAIDs, in general, um, we try to avoid in patients with chronic kidney disease. 
Um, aspirin, however, doesn't have the same adverse effects that, that NSAIDs do. And under the um, prescription uh, or under the guidance of your doctor, aspirin um, is an okay therapy. And just, I, I will say, I have a lot of discussions about patients that NSAIDs, they're very good pain medications, and um, they, I think there's a role to use them in chronic patients with chronic kidney disease, even at severe levels. So I would have just moderated that a little bit to say, especially at lower levels of GFR, they should not be used. But I, I'll tell you, I have patients who low levels of kidney function have an acute injury, and let's take three days of NSAIDs because it's better than the alternatives. And, you know, this, it, it, uh, again, I think comes back to having a really good relationship with your doctor where you can discuss how to do things in the short term versus make a general pattern for, you know, you can never do this versus, yes, this is a very reasonable option um, to help solve a, an acute problem. Yep, that's a good point. Um, I believe we probably only have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, here's one on, can you elaborate on the anatomical features and or functions of the uterus involving the collagen proteins impacted by Alport mutations? Who would like to start with that? So I, I can start. So the, the type 4 collagen that's affected by Alport syndrome is not present in the uterus. It is not. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a question here about, are there any specific studies on women who have gone through pregnancy as an Alport patient? Um, there are just the case reports that I mentioned earlier where an ind or a paper is written about an individual patient, but there's no large studies of outcomes in women with Alport syndrome. It's on my list of things to do. Okay. And I think I have uh, time for one more question. And um, it just is, and I think just related to um, this uh, person wants to know if the disease progression would be similar as other uh, family members, male or female. Um, so you, it's hard to predict how a individual woman with X-linked Alport syndrome is going to progress um, in men in the same family. Um, they may progress at similar rates because they have the same mutation. But in women in the same family, you can't predict um, how an individual woman is going to do. So if your grandmother had end-stage kidney disease with X-linked Alport syndrome, that doesn't mean that you're going to. Um, or if she just had hematuria her whole life, that doesn't mean you're not at risk for um, end-stage kidney disease. Okay, thank you. So we just have a couple minutes left. And um, I would just like to, um, to go back to each of our um, expert panelists again. Thank you very much for your time today. And I would just like um, for you to um, just provide what is your most important takeaway for our community today, women and girls with Alport syndrome. And um, I'll start with Dr. Rowe. Yeah, so my takeaway would be to take care of your own kidney health. Um, I see a lot of children with chronic kidney disease due to Alport syndrome, um, and I'll often ask the mom, you know, oh, how are your kidneys doing? And they'll tell me, oh, well, I haven't, haven't been in to see the doctor, or, or I don't know, or I'm, I'm okay. Um, but it, it is important for you to, to, to take care of yourself and, and make sure that you're getting the care and the treatment that you need. Thank you. Dr. Anker? Um, my take would be to takeaway would be to find a nephrologist, a doctor that you can have a relationship with, that you're living your life with Alfred syndrome and your family's life and life changes and things happen and you want your doctor to know you and to understand you to help be able to help you make the decisions in the context of what's going on in your life at the particular time. Thank you. Dr. McKelvey? And I think my takeaway would be um, really just reiteration of what Dr. Rowe and Dr. Inker said, uh, taking care of yourself, uh, having a good working relationship with your physician, whether it be your nephrologist or your OBGYN, um, and hopefully they'll be able to have good working relationships with each other so that you can maximize what you wanna get out of your life while still living with um, outports or any other chronic disease.